Hello and welcome. I see people trickling in um, and you have a poll that is welcoming you. Uh, so please, um, please do that while we're waiting for everyone to join us. Um, we'll wait one more minute and then get started. All right, I think we can I think we can get started and have uh, everyone come on, our guests and speaker. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Romy. Um, so welcome to the first uh, network uh, book forum in our three part series, um, Spotlighting the Distance Cure by Hannah Zeven. Um, I'm Livia Garofalo. I'm an anthropologist and a researcher on the health and data team at Data and Society. Um, I will be your host along CJ and Nazalie, who are wonderfully coordinating things behind the virtual curtain. Um, so Data and Society, if you don't know, is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. Um, and we produce original research and regularly convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. So if you're joining us from a computer, uh, you can use the features at the bottom of your screen to participate. Uh, you can use the closed captioning function for subtitles. Uh, you can ask and upvote questions in the Q&A. Um, this uh, event is being recorded and will be shared afterwards. Um, and you can join the conversation on Twitter by tagging uh, Data and Society and today's panelists. So we will be spending the next hour or so together. So we should let, uh, we should get ourselves sort of settled. Um, we wanted to start by doing a digital land acknowledgement. Um, so Data and Society began in New York City, uh, an island node in a large network of hills, rivers, and mountains in the Atlantic Northeast. No, known as Lenape Hogging, um, the ancestral land of Leni Lenape people. Uh, today we are connected online via a different network, uh, a vast array of servers, humans, and computer devices. Uh, in the United States, much of the system sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. And as an organization, we recognize this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory around the world. We commit to dismantling all ongoing settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital worlds. You'll notice a link to nativeland.ca in the chat. And if you haven't already used the QA feature to share your location, um, I am in Philadelphia, Hannah is in the Bay Area and Romy is in London. So we have quite an array of locations um, and we wanna know where all you are joining from. So do that in the chat. So today's program is part of Data and Society's network events, which provide a platform for scholars and researchers to present their work, frame key debates in the field, and gather feedback from a community of interdisciplinary thinkers. Um, the Distance Cure, A History of Teletherapy is the new book by uh, UC Berkeley lecturer and media researcher, uh, Hannah Zeven. Um, and it offers a timely reminder of how recursive that crisis of care is by tracing how therapists and patients have turned more willingly and more often than one might expect to form of mediation that take treatment from one to one to one to many. In addition to Hannah Zeven, we are so glad to be joined by our panelist, Dr. Romy Gadel Rab, a psychiatrist and design researcher who can speak to how themes from this book show up in her work and practice and bring in some of the UK context too. So with that, Hannah, take it away. Thank you so much uh, and good morning and afternoon and evening to everyone. Thank you, Livia and Nazali and CJ and of course, Romy for joining everyone at Data and Society and everyone joining now or belatedly afterwards. I'm so honored to be given the opportunity to speak with all of you. I just wanna start by briefly describing my larger research concerns that shaped this book. Uh, my research focuses on the co-constitutive social, technical, and cultural factors in technologies that are used for care in the 20th century into our contemporary landscape. 
I focus on technologies at the interface between people in distance relationships. Technologies that are charged with doing the task of what we're doing exactly right now, relating across distance. Technologies that allow us to communicate where it would otherwise not be possible, uh, especially in helping and familial and caregiving relationships. The relationships I'm interested in and focus on in my work are extraordinary or primary sites of connection, which then serve as case studies for thinking about how to negotiate the ethics and problems of mediated interaction, intimacy, and care more generally. So I wanna begin by thinking about intimacy. Intimacy has two standard senses in English, the one we might most commonly use for closely acquainted or very familiar people, intimates, and as a euphemism as well for centuries now for sex, as in intimate relations. In both senses, intimacy is thought of as proceeding from relation, that intimacy occurs between people at the smallest of scales to you know, the pair, to say the largest of scales, the crowd and the nation. It's a mode of interaction that carries with it perhaps obligation or expectation or feeling. Mass intimacy is not, as it were, a contradiction in terms, nor is intimate intimacy redundant. But intimacy occurs too between a person and themselves. Intimacy can be carried out on one's own to become auto-intimate, as I talk about in The Distance Cure. And finally, intimacy can be a quality that is inmost or intrinsic, something that can be intimate to oneself because it's internal. Intimacy asks us to go locate it, not just where we feel it, but in what mode. But this definition constructs intimacy as human to human, a feeling structure, and immediately flattens those humans into a kind of fungible equivalence, calling them by the same name, two intimates. Yet two intimates do not somehow undo power or difference by their familiarity, as power and difference are never located just in individuals. As Fred Moden writes of friendship, just one of the many forms of intimate relating, quote, Friendship is what survives knowing one another. Friendship comes before knowing one another and it survives knowing one another. It survives the rules of individuation that incarcerates the difference that actually makes friendship possible. It both anticipates and survives that individuation, end quote. Or friendship is that which survives intimacy. Intimacy is thought of as a positive human value, much like the terms care and empathy. But that assertion that intimacy is a proper and dear form of relating also covers over that intimacy can conceal and carry, or perhaps what is always true about being made familiar. It can be a form of violence. Intimacy is at first an action as opposed to an achieved state. The state of being intimate follows the action of making something intimate making it familiar, making us familiar, surveilled, however unevenly. Sometimes we think and fantasize and presume intimacy when it's not there, but proceed as if it is. That's like the parasocial, the Twitter. Sometimes intimacy is present and we do not detect it until after it's been acted on. Sometimes intimacy is short-term or a form of what I call in my work paid attention, rule-based and bounded. And then those boundaries are violated. When intimacy is covert or coercive, when it is unwelcome, even just a little bit, intimacy is experienced as monstrous. And it can be worse than that too. What does intimacy instruct? Following Denise De Silva, we might ask what kinds of entanglements produce and result from intimacy when we are made familiar, whether via play, care, love, or surveillance, capture, or control. I like to think about intimacy as this complex web where we can complicate how we think about this mode of interaction. Proximity and knowledge do imply intimacy, but they do not imply trust or consent. Humans are not, of course, only intimate with other humans, nor just with ourselves. We have this form of familiarity with architectures, geographies, our machines, and perhaps equally importantly, places and spaces and tools have intimacy with us. My book, The Distance Cure, A History of Teletherapy, was published this summer by MIT Press. And there, 
the intimacy under consideration is carried between the therapist, broadly defined, and patient, and technology. In the book, I revise our idea of the therapeutic dyad to argue we're always working through some version of that triad, patient, therapist, and media. The distance cure makes uh, several other interventions by examining the therapist and patient working at a distance from one another. Globally, it retells the history of clinical psychology via its shadow form, teletherapy. Instead of this being a recent concern in the ongoing global pandemic or in the quote unquote age of big tech, I argue that teletherapy and additionally telemedicine have been about to make their grand debut for about 100 years. Teletherapy is as old as therapy itself. Then the book first takes that extraordinary and vulnerable relationship between therapist and patient to explore what forms of intimacy, noble and ignoble, are possible in these extraordinary configurations. I argue that since Freud stopped laying hands on his patients as part of hypnosis, some intervening distance has always been present between patient and therapist, even in the room. Then I proceed to look at how patients and therapists have bridged that distance in order for communication to happen. Mediated, networked, and teletherapeutic relationships physically literalize this separation, even as they work to diminish it. As I conducted my research in order to make this critical history of teletherapy, which starts in 1890 and goes right through 2020, it turns out that teletherapy almost always attends crisis, whether that's World War II, the war for liberation in Algeria, suicide epidemics in San Francisco, and of course, our current pandemic unfolding right now. While these cases are quite different from one another, I unite them by making the claim that distance is not the opposite of presence, absences. If tele isn't in absence, what is it? The book elaborates various forms of what I call distanced intimacy, which is why I began with this you know, series of questions about intimacy. Uh, and how I think about what it does and what it might conceal, what might be possible and impossible. Um, and I'm going to leave it there and turn it back over. Thank you so much again for joining. This is Livia again. Thanks so much, Hannah, for that uh, introduction. You uh, stole some of the quotes that I wanted to bring up. Uh, I think one of the strengths really of the book is sort of historicizing and contextualizing this idea about therapeutic relationships being conducted without bodies or without an immediate physical present. Uh, and that mediation is always part of these encounters. I mean, you go from Freud's letters to when it caught in the radio, Esther Perel and her podcast, which some of us have been listening to, um, crisis hotlines, chatbots, Zoom therapy. Um, I think one of the interesting things is that, right, you're, you're not really saying that the medium is the message, but, or not necessarily that, but that all media are active metaphors for something else. Um, and one of the quotes that really struck me was this idea of um, distance is not the opposite of presence, absences. And maybe we can talk about that uh, later, because I think we've all been living in a time right now where we are in a paradox, right? We have distance is the thing that has been um, protecting us, but also something that's been harming us immensely. Um, it's, uh, you use the Greek word pharmakon, which is one of my favorite words, uh, which means both poison and remedy. Uh, this distance that we're all immersed in is both um, disease and cure. Uh, one of the other things that I found really interesting about the book is the reframing of this debate uh, more, it's more than loss of something and it's more than the meddling or impurity of something. Um, you talk about how we all have to reconcile with these, all these intimacies that you talk, talk about um, and we're all living in something that is not the same thing, but we're living as something that is as if sort of presence, which is sort of also as if it's a, is one of the main frameworks of, of therapeutic and psychodynamic um, and psychodynamic work. Uh, so instead of seeing it as a loss, you, you talk about how it's a rupture, right? And ruptures and disruptions can be very, can carry revelations in many ways. Um, 
And I, I'll turn it to Romy, but there's one quote that I really uh, loved. Um, and you say, teletherapy is not merely a site for working on the general capacity to be with the other via time with a disembodied other. It is also a tool for developing the ability to tolerate being alone. And I think that's so many people have felt <laughs> have tried to figure out how do we tolerate being alone and being um, at a distance from from our intimate others, whoever they might be. Um, but Romy, uh, we want to hear your thoughts as well. So to you. Oh, thank you very much, Livia. And of course, massive thanks to uh, Hannah for writing this book and for giving me the opportunity to read it um, over these last few weeks. I really, really enjoyed it, I have to say. And I guess for me, it was really like completely re, re sort of framing my ideas around teletherapy, if I'm honest, because I found it quite like a refreshing lens on that exhausted narrative of Zoom fatigue that we were mentioning earlier. You know, everyone's like, oh, I don't want to you know I'm very happy that people have attended today <laughs> because there's this kind of like notion going around of like please no um and kind of giving me this background that actually therapy and like mental health kind of practice has had a relationship with technology like you're saying like back from 1890 uh, almost which is something I hadn't really thought I thought I'd been kind of forced into something that I was initially a bit resistant to um so you know, I'm a psychiatrist and I've been working in the NHS for about over 10 years. And in the NHS, we still have Windows 95, I'm pretty sure, and, you know, computers that don't have cameras. And you know, I'm very aware that we need innovation. And then, as you talk about in the book, lots of time, innovation in these spaces ends up, sorry to say, with kind of like tech bros and, and Silicon Valley, when really, it, you know, it's something that we're trying to, maybe benefit humanity sounds a bit strong, but, you know, we're trying to, um, work out how we can help care for more when there is a big need and when lots of people can't reach it. Um, but yeah, I guess initially I was very resistant to teletherapy. I was, I was in that camp that thought the physical embodiment was really necessary for a kind of therapeutic relationship. I would say kind of as you allude to in the book, but a lot of my assessments when I meet people might happen before they even start talking, when they walk down the corridor, when they sit in, in my clinic. Um, so I think I was very concerned about that initially and this idea of distance intimacy actually distance intimacy like almost yeah completely pivoted how I feel about it almost <laughs> because in the pandemic I was thrust into talking to people from my bedroom every single day you know people really struggling having a really difficult time um, kind of from my bedroom into their bedroom which actually is probably the most intimate Thing you can do <laughs> you know with with strangers in a sense and you know I recall one time in uh, the pandemic myself and my professor dialing in to a patient who's very very depressed and um, he was there sat in his bed with the computer you know shirtless and it was yeah a very new experience to all the boundaries and framework that you talk about in the book and kind of more traditional psychotherapeutic relationships um, yeah, so I guess that was, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> it, it kind of almost uh, refreshed how I feel maybe when a lot of my work has turned digital. Um, and I guess the other thing I think we won't be able to escape talking about, I mean, I also work uh, some of my time in a problematic internet gaming uh, clinic. And so it does make me think about the, the next evolution of the technology and, and what it means to be a therapist with Web3 and everything. I'm, I'm sorry if it was, if I shouldn't bring that up, but I think we need to think about it, or I need to think about it anyway, how I'm going to reach the people that I work with. So thanks. Um, is it back to you, Livia? <laughs> uh, no, thanks, Jeremy. I think having the perspective of you as a practitioner is really important. And I know uh, some people who, who register for this event are, are practitioners. And so we want, we want to hear from you how, how you've experienced this. Um, this shift because there are questions uh, about labor um, and that are really important. Who should be, who should and who has been tasked to perform the labor of caring for others? Um, bots have done this also. There is this idea, I don't know if people have been pestered by uh, Instagram ads uh, from companies like Talkspace, BetterHelp, um, and sort of this idea that we can shift the labor 
to either platforms or non-human agents, or that this labor should always be available 24-7, uh, as some of the advertising sort of uh, uh, says it should be. Uh, so I think there are interesting questions about labor that, Hannah, you also talk about in the book, uh, and how the sort of the, the labor has <laughs> has shifted right from from Freud to a chatbot uh, who is also and maybe we can also talk about the kind of therapy that these that that we are going towards or that is more prevalent which is CBT and I don't know if you are much better versed you, the two of you in what this is uh, maybe we can have a conversation of, about that too what kind of models of care are being um, pushed and supported yeah, thank you so much for that. And thank you, Rami and Livia, again. Um, I'm I'm so touched that it could be of any sort of repositioning use. I mean, the that shift that Rami, you're talking about, that kind of February, March 2020 shift was really traumatic for a lot of clinicians as well as their patients. And um, there was something I think you know, unprecedented in the kind of from one space to another overnight as it was mandated compared to every other set of crises that I write about where there's some different sense of warning with very few exceptions like Hurricane Maria, right, where also it was an overnight before and after change. But in terms of this high level labor question, um, to give some kind of charting of the book, if the book starts with, yes, like Papa Freud, um, who it is well known in some circles, like media theory, psychoanalysis, that Freud loved media metaphors. It, what was less well known is that Freud was also really making use of media to treat himself and his patients, uh, in part because of this idea of crisis and frame shift from the office to other ways of gathering. Uh, Freud practiced through World War I. Uh, at one point, he had zero paying patients uh, and in fact was giving his money to his patients to help them in that moment and through the Spanish influenza to which Freud would lose a daughter as well. So there are some resonances with our moment and Jacqueline Rose has written really beautifully about that. But almost immediately after, there was this destabilization of both money and where therapy should happen and how. Uh, this is has to do with the democratizing sort of um, impulses of both uh, teletherapy specifically and therapy sometimes generally. How can we reach more patients? Uh, that has meant that for a hundred years, there have been different ideas about how to batch process patients. Uh, for some, that's the quicker, uh, therefore less expensive version, CBT, which comes into prominence in the 1960s, increasingly so. Uh, for some, it's the volunteer hotline uh, or crisis text line, which allows a kind of batch processing of patients. Uh, and for some, it's, it's publicly funded mental health care, like at the NHS, which we don't have a, a kind of system in this way in the United States. And yes, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Thank you, CJ. So these are all the different things at play. On the one hand, a good devaluation of expertise that allows for pure care, a radical one, on the other hand, one that's made therapy paradoxically extremely expensive and devalued in terms of, of its labor, where the therapist is always on and supposed to be answering a myriad of text messages across an impossible caseload in the case of like a contemporary teletherapy app. So there's a lot of different kinds and qualities and genres of teletherapy that we can have on the table as well. Yeah, it's interesting that you also bring up this idea of, of money, of money as mediation. And I think another conversation that is important to have is who's paying for these services. And I think having you, Romy, here as, uh, you know, working in the NHS and in a system that is not present in the U.S. Uh, is really interesting because who should take, who should take responsibility for the mental health care of its uh of citizens, right? Um, and so media, money in a way is also something, I think Hannah, this is what you talk about, that creates the distance, right? The necessary distance that, and sort of a controlled framed intimacy of the therapeutic moment. Um, but at the same time, we are in a, in a time where there is such need for mental health care and yet not, and not a scarcity of those who practice it, but huge structural inequalities that also prevent people from accessing care. So. 
Yeah, Romy, I don't know if you, I think a comparative perspective on this is really interesting. Um, I'm, I'm Italian, I grew, also grew up in a system that has a, a national healthcare service. So uh, I think that's a very, it's important to contextualize the US as a very specific context uh, for these dynamics too. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I can't talk as much to the US system. Um, we are incredibly lucky in the UK to have the NHS. It's like our national treasure kind of thing um, that we always talk about. I guess the difficulty with that is like, like you were just saying around labor, there is actually a kind of shortage of availability of psychologists in the NHS and psychiatrists, especially in certain parts of England, you know, there might be one psychiatrist for thousands and thousands of people. And um, therefore sometimes it means the thresholds of who gets that therapy. Um, you know, I work in a, half my week is in the gaming clinic, but half of my week is in a treatment resistant depression kind of clinic. And that's, a, you know, it's a very th high threshold to get to that clinic in a sense. Um, when like you're saying, we're in, a, we're in another shifting time where actually lots of people are struggling, lots of people could really benefit from talking therapy and lots of people, might not be able to kind of broach a, a self-helped or self-guided CBT, cognitive behavioral kind of model that we were talking about. I do think the chapter in the book that does talk about um, previous psychiatrists or researchers attempts to solve this by inventing these sort of chatbots that will either, you know, replace the, the therapist or in the end, when they see that doesn't really working well, I think he tries to say, okay, well, it will replace the patient and, and, and help train lots of therapists that are needed. I thought that was very interesting. Um, I guess we're also seeing shifts, so to pivot away a bit, but seeing shifts in the way people are interacting. Um, so people are interacting with these sorts of apps, I guess they're still relatively new. Um, but certainly in the UK, we have a tech service, I think you have something similar in America called Shout. Um, where I know that um, they have lots of figures, sorry, I can't name them off the top of my head, around like young people actually preferring to use apps like Wobot, which is an, an AI-enabled chatbot, or text services like Shout um, when they are looking for kind of immediate help. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this is back to Hannah. Um, I think that that's really fascinating, right, that there are different groups of people who feel safer or even pre-consciously or unconsciously more comfortable with various media rather than other media. And so, yes, on the one hand, my book is uh, a history of therapeutic labor. It can't not be, but it's also very patient centered. And even long before this moment in the kind of ubiquitous smartphone uh, era, and also of course the pandemic, there have been patients who will only be in treatment if it's not in the room, right? Who, if they, if they can use an e-cyber e clinic in 1993, if they can text or chat, uh, if they can write letters. So that resistance to being in the room uh, has been framed by traditional in-person psychotherapy as something to be worked through and interpreted by putting the person in the room rather than starting at the distance and meeting the patient where they are. And so I think that that's a, a good moment of flexibility that the pandemic has quickened, right? And, and, and brought to the fore, which is that actually the room isn't always the answer for everyone. Uh, and that raises questions about a kind of going forward in a hybrid mode where some patients really need the physical connection. They need the reason to leave their house, to come to the office. And some patients will never be able to for all kinds of reasons, physical, psychological, economic, and so on, geographical, linguistic, make use of the kind of static traditional setting. Uh, yeah, this is Livia again. Um, so yeah, we uh, will have another uh, small poll. I uh, Naz posted in the chat this Wisa, uh, which Hannah, you talk about in the book, which is a chatbot. Uh, so we're asking you, would you be willing to participate in therapy performed by a bot? Um, it seems like a lot of you are saying no, uh, but I would encourage you to try the, Wisa is a penguin, sort of is a, a little penguin figure that uh, you can kind of rant to. I mean, there's something very freeing about ranting to 
someone who is not burdened by your brand. Um, but I, I, I encourage you to try it because it's uh, it's interesting, but also it raises questions about when is when is the shift needed to an person to a person, regardless of whether they're physically present or um, or who can you can talk via Zoom and see their faces. Um, there's a liability issue also too here, right? And and please put questions in the chat, uh, everyone, as we have this discussion. Go ahead, Romy. Oh, sorry, yeah, uh, it's Romy. So I was gonna say, when you just mentioned that kind of liability issue as well, again, we have slightly different systems in the UK, but I think one of my huge hesitations uh, when I work with people in, in a lot of difficulty was what happens if they just put down the screen? You know, what happens if they just close the Zoom call because I can't guarantee where they are? Well, if they're in the room with me, you know, I can try and do something about whatever's going on. You know, it's never 100%. But I think that I think that was a big fear for, I think, a lot of therapists who, like you were saying, were just kind of thrust into something we weren't careful about, uh, that we didn't know enough about. And yes, it was like, re, you know, learning new tech platforms and kind of completely different ways of working in terms of, uh, you know, there's lots of boundaries that you, you talk about in the book, but that exist in therapy, you know, usually maybe uh, patients don't have my personal email address, for example, so they don't email me in the middle of the night, but now the way it's happened, because we've had to move so quickly, and we don't have enough things in place is that lots of people have my email address, because I have to send them a zoom link because the teams link isn't working. And, um, you know, I think that put a lot of additional strain, but on, on the kind of flip side of that, like you were saying, um, while, you know, the NHS, for example, is a, a huge institution, it can be resistant to change. And there can be a lot of kind of red tape in putting through new things and the kind of pandemic just meant we just had to do it. You know, we had to figure out a way, you know, every hospital might've been using a different system, but we were finding, we were finding a way. Um, and along the way, having to learn like what is security for our patients what is protection how do we save files without it being risky um but it, it has enabled this completely new way of working and like you say may i think for many people will be a hybrid way of working i can't take an afternoon off i feel like i shouldn't take an afternoon off to go and do my own therapy you know having it on zoom for, for 50 minutes is, is much more handy and means i can actually definitely make my therapy if there's another crisis going on that i need to deal with I think that's so important to bring up. This is Hannah again. And Rami, thank you for that. Uh, I see also in the chat, there's a kind of question about liability and legality here, right? The idea that when the when I can see the patient face to face, I know they're okay. And somehow when it's a voice or uh, on text, uh, not so much. There, That question has haunted, how do we protect and know what's going on with the patient at distance? so much of what's been possible legally up until the pandemic in the United States context, where, um, you know, uh, I have a case in my book where I talk about an early sort of therapeutic um, sort of digital advice column at Cornell University uh, run by uh, Jerry Feist as the psychologist, but under the pseudonym Uncle Ezra. Uh, and Ezra being the, the founder of Cornell. And the one of the first messages is a maybe prank, maybe serious uh, suicide note. Um, and A, you can't tell because it's, it's not uh, tonally clear. And B, then what do you do? And that opened up this whole crisis of how can we ever have that kind of service for college students given the, in the United States context, the huge problem with liability. And we see it still even today where, um, you know, though the pandemic changed what kind of platforms you can use with your patients, there are huge licensure issues, very particular to the US. Can you talk to a patient from California who's in Philadelphia? Can you talk when you're on vacation at the same time as the therapist is now always on? So working while on vacation, you know, what is the, the legal limit of this kind of communication? Uh, and in the UK context, I don't know, but, but someone asked in the chat about that. What are the limits of working this way? And what are the fears? And one of the fears, of course, in all mental health care work is losing a patient. I would 
that is where me again. I, I would certainly say that is my major fear. Um, would be losing the patient, not helping someone that you know that needed you, and if that medium that we're using actually was not as constructive as if they were face to face. You know, I guess that's that was the hugest fear for me. Um, I, I saw the question about kind of malpractice. Um, it's I think it is a bit different in the UK. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how to kind of word it. I think it's diff different in the UK. It's not really that we get sued as much, um, but we do have to have indemnity. We have to have insurance. And again, we didn't know that, I didn't know in the beginning, like, are we covered to see exactly all the things you said? Am, am I covered to see someone from my house on Zoom? And I think, I think statements were made fairly early on that the kind of indemnity would cover you to do, to do your job. Um, but it's been a bit kind of learning on the go and on the whole we usually work a lot as teams I mean I'm a psychiatrist it might be different for a, a private psychoanalyst for example but we usually work in teams with nurses psychologists consultants professors um, so usually it's like a, a big team thing that you might talk about um, if you had concerns about someone we have crisis teams that can go to people's homes um, yeah so we would try and do everything we can to help someone um, but of course, you know, any any time you lose a patient, it is it is investigated. It goes to a coroner's court. I've been to court. I wasn't being sued. It's 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 investigative to make sure that we didn't miss something or that something can't be done better again in the future. Yeah, and it's it's important for this reason also that you you as providers have time to have your own therapy and and have have time to process those losses. Um, so we have some interesting questions in the chat, uh, in the Q&A rather, uh, so please keep posting these. We have uh, an interesting question about the privacy implications of online therapy, which, you know, data and society is, is obviously concerned with. Um, how is the data being used? Um, and another question um, that is about uh, the people behind creating therapy bots. Um, and the political economic context that enables sort of this, uh, this mode of interaction to be, um, uh, let's see. I mean, maybe I can, I'm not trying to be funny, batch process those together to talk about this question of, so to start with the second question first about political, economic uh, and historical conditions. Um, the, the quest, that is quite elusive for a decent uh, human uh, mimicking therapist bot starts in the 1960s, uh, born out of this really particular US problem, which is that before World War II, um, mental health care predominantly was done via the asylum. And between World War II and say 1960, three, two, we had this move from asylum to community mental health right? Closing the asylums, opening the community, mental health centers, except they were never fully funded. And so what resulted, and we're still living uh, out this problem, still 60 years later, um, was a patchwork care of system, a patchwork system of care that didn't really function and functioned really unevenly. So one thing that's a problem when, when we talk about therapy, say, is we mean a hundred things at once. Uh, Rami just mentioned, right? Like it's very different for the psychoanalyst in private practice with their predominantly very wealthy clients uh, than the kind of one-off clinic scene that might, might be uh, also happening at the same time in the same city, right? So they're just very different zones. But in that moment, Kenneth Colby uh, was the first person to on purpose make a kind of therapy chatbot uh, working very similarly. And just after Joseph Weizenbaum accidentally made a Eliza, who if you're a Gen X, you might have played with in the 80s when, when she was put back online. And it's a very famous therapeutic and technological artifact. So ever since then, people have been working on it, predominantly in Silicon Valley or in academia as a problem. And the technology hasn't gotten that much better from the user's perspective. Uh, there's less friction. Um, and so now to move to the privacy part, right? But there are now huge different problems around privacy, precisely because of scale and the fact that um, many of these companies in Silicon Valley, some are in New York, 
some are international and beyond the United States, uh, are not sure what the sort of financial picture is going to be because the services are, as is very typical, free, but a huge amount of data is being gathered, right? And the idea is in a data futures. Uh, so there are leaks. I like, like clockwork every four months, a huge leak or a hacking happens of this very sensitive, like extremely sensitive data. And sometimes it's human error uh, where a therapy you know, service will like essentially tweet it out. They'll by accident CC a bunch of patients instead of BCC. So there are different kinds of privacy questions. And then also how it's experienced by the patient even irrespective of that in their mind, in fantasy. Or, or even in their own home, um, you know, because it's harder to, to have therapy in your own home when you have a shared house or you have four children in your house. Um, so something that we, we talk of as very digital actually has like, you know, in real life privacy difficulties. And just, yeah, something else I was thinking about as you were, you were talking about as well as there's been some other evolutions such as emotion recognition technology through facial recognition technology that I know um, in, you know, coming to be used in therapy apps, which could be incredibly helpful, but is something also um, that we have to question because I know they were being used in, you know, apps with filters like Snapchat, for example, to, you know, maybe see how we feel and then sell us things when we're in a certain mood. And we want to make sure that sort of data is, is not, in any way um, being taken when you are trying to access therapy and you don't want your Instagram to then add, you know, while you've told your therapist, you look very sad and you've cried. You don't want them to then be able to sell you something in a vulnerable moment, which I, you know, is just horrendous, <laughs> but the kind of capitalistic world that we live in. Yeah, this is, yeah, exactly. I mean, it also, there's a whole other conversation that we could have about algorithms and, uh, predictive diagnostics of patients and digital phenotyping, which is something that is emerging as sort of a taking uh, potential patients' um, online behavior and making inferences, right, about their diagnoses, which uh, has sort of privacy implications, but also has epistemological questions about what a diagnosis is and how you do that as a, as a provider. Um, had an interesting question in the Q&A about distance intimacy that extends beyond the therapeutic diet triad. Uh, has participation in teletherapy and reading, writing this book helped you rethink therapy itself, identify future parallels of the therapeutic model and something like gaming, um, since uh, Romy, you mentioned that, or other online communities. Therapeutic content is available on Instagram, on TikTok, on um, many different platforms. So I think that's an interesting, interesting question to think about. Um, I mean, I could answer very, very quickly to that. I think it's just, it's just got me thinking. I've only read this book in the last sort of month. And well, I was thinking about it a little bit before um, Mr. Zuckerberg came along with his uh, horrible presentation. Um, but we already have in the UK, lots of research going on. We have different therapies delivered by virtual reality and delivered by avatar already, um, not by algorithms or anything like with human therapists behind those. Um, so there's something we are already researching. And I, I think it's from my work in the gaming clinic and seeing how some of the young people don't like to turn their videos on uh, if you video call them um, and are more comfortable in alternative forms of therapy. Um, I'd be very interested to see how it develops. And I'm, I'm not totally against having a clinic in Web3 one day. I was actually looking into it the other day, but it's incredibly expensive to buy land in these places. So if anyone wants to help me, if a charity <laughs> wants to help me, it's very complicated. Yeah, the um, this is Hannah again. The the having to keep the physical office and then the Web three office is just you know economically going to be a sheer impossibility, which I think has also been, um, you know, I wrote this entire book before the pandemic. And the book was accepted right as we went into lockdown. So I was just able to add this shorter coda called When Distance Is Everywhere about the lockdown. And one, so I interviewed lots of clinicians about the first six or seven weeks uh, in lockdown doing 
that early uh, teletherapy. And the younger clinicians were devastated because they had just signed leases on their offices. They had felt like they just made this step forward as professional caregivers. And then also, I mean, emotionally devastated, but also financially, because they were, you know, they were building their practices. They had this lease and their new practices were contracting. Um, so many gave up their offices. So it's interesting to think about not uh, having no office and saving that money and readjusting fees, but instead paying for something in Web3, Web3, which is right here, apparently for me. Um, but also this other part of the question about distanced intimacy beyond, you know, um, the therapeutic, you know, I think just the answer is yes. I think that, you know, all of the ways I think about distanced intimacy cross in and out of the therapeutic. Um, I write some in the introduction that Elizabeth Wilson, uh, the amazing uh, scholar and theorist at Emory, thinks of the therapeutic relationship as always a kind of virtual or artificial relationship, precisely because in therapy, everything that comes from our early life is going to come up. So my second book is about mediated mothering in parenting tech, which is another form of distanced intimacy, the one reprised maybe when you're like, oh, my therapist and transference and things like this, but also with friendship, uh, with celebrities, a kind of parasocial, all of these different ways of thinking about how we relate to others at difference, at difference and at distance are, are there, um, both mediated and even just like in the crowd uh, offline. Um, I love that question. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple of questions going back sort of to data and power dynamics and sort of uh, heritage of how data and um, sort of categorization has been used um, in this country and in many other countries. Who, um, who should, reg again, this is the eternal question about governance, who should regulate these platforms? Um, who should um, be overseeing how these bots are being built? Uh, and I think, again, that is a very contextual question. Um, we can't, you know, we have other <laughs> problems of governance with other major tech companies. So, uh, but I think that's an interesting question and it's, it's been uh, upvoted. So it sounds like people wanna, wanna hear about, about that and intricacies with the criminal justice system, US healthcare, sort of other ways that people are being sort of typified and risk profiles are being used for other, other ways than are, than are not care. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to talk a little bit about both these things. Um, first, in general, I think the first thing to say is that many of the platforms that we're talking about are just, they're not regulated. Um, when I said when we use the word therapy, now we're speaking about a hundred different things. Uh, corporations know that. So there are different ways to skirt um, being regulated. If you're a wellness app, it's very different than if you're therapeutic. If you're a mental health companion, as in the cute, adorable penguin or replica, uh, you also don't have to have different kinds of approval. Um, something like 3% of the thousands of therapy apps uh, in the Apple App Store have had to report and have reported on their efficacy at all. Uh, most of them don't, and most of them have no studies, and people are still downloading them. So I saw there was a little bit of a comment on um, naivete or uh, consumer knowledge, therapeutic knowledge. Yes, that's a huge problem in this area. Uh, and in terms of the algorithms that also work in our, our so-called justice system, uh, this has also been for decades part of it. The sort of psychiatric profiles are part of everything from sentencing, you know, Compass, which I know Data and Society has done great work on, um, to, you know, this new crisis I'm writing about in my second book, where there are increasingly punitive uh, laws around the right to mother, the right to parent from, from for the incarcerated parent, where these same profiles are coming up again and restricting rights and access to children and so on. So of course they work together. Um, I can share in the chat, I've written a little bit about the suicide hotline, which goes back and forth between the psychical and the carceral quite quickly. Um, so there are lots of overlaps and bleeds between policing and mental health care, care 
uh, and uh, so on as well. It's a very complicated history, but tons of co-construction of those total institutions. Yeah, really, really interesting question. Go ahead, Romy. Oh, thank you. I don't have lots more to add. I guess I was just thinking on a very practical level, um, you know, thinking about medical diligence in these apps, as you were talking about, Hannah. So um, many of these apps should um, have scientific boards. And I think obviously, you know, the consumers don't, you know, you, when you're downloading an app, you're not thinking about who their scientific board is. But I think that has to be, I think that should come into more regulation instead of people skirting the regulations. Like you say, that if you say you're a medical, medical app, you then have to get FDA approval, that sort of thing, um, which makes it far more expensive and complicated for the people that make these apps. Um, but I would say having, um, you know, if, if we start questioning it more, if the users start questioning it more, hopefully, you know, there'll be some pressure. Um, there's also a group I love called Internet Age Media, and I've been to a lot of their conferences and they talk about this idea of almost having a sort of um, like United Nations slash WHO for the internet. Um, and I think it's an interesting thing to think about, you know, if we are gonna move more and more to Web3, which I hope I don't personally, but, um, you know, who is who are regulating these people that have all the control is a, is a very important question. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, we're almost at time. Um, but wanted to, yeah, just remark also uh, one thought that I was having about how the deployment of these chat boxes being also considered in, in economics and development studies. So where are these things traveling to uh, and how sort of models of the mind and models of the self that are happening in these contexts are being sort of exported in, in another sort of colonial uh, sort of reimagining in a different in a different way. Um, we have a question uh, about uh, ASMR, which is sort of another way of distanced intimacy. I don't know if you guys have thoughts about about that. And then maybe we can sort of start closing with some final remarks unless there are other questions. Um, there's a question about open source apps or chatbots like Signal and Telegram. Um, lots of directions that this, could, that this could go in because we've all been in a distance to see for so long. Sorry, I meant to unmute. Hannah, I don't know, you're nodding your head to ASMR because all I know is I have watched soap videos, which I'm slightly embarrassed about. <laughs> soap cutting videos. Nothing to be embarrassed about. Um, <laughs> I'm nodding my head about ASMR because I have a section at the end of one of my chapters in the parenting book about kids using ASMR videos. Um, and various, you know, media that uh, Mara Mills uh, has this coinage have an assistive pretext that then are being taken up by kids in the pandemic as a kind of self-soothing. Um, and so I'm, I was nodding at ASMR, like, yes, there are lots of users, uh, including kids. But the thing that's fascinating to me about kids is ASMR in general is thought of as me and the video, right? I'm listening to whispering. So that what the children that I'm writing about do, uh, it's them, the video, and they get on the phone with their friends. So they make this community out of all listening to the same video, uh, putting these two systems together, but like the digital cell phone, but also the YouTube, and then talking through the video, right? Like, instead of just passively taking in the whispering sounds. So I was nodding this idea. It's a, both a mass intimacy, um, which I write about in my book, but also this kind of batch processing, ad hoc, peer support. And then that brings up a different kind of therapeutic labor, right? The ASMR video star, uh, of which there are many, and thinking about the YouTube referral uh, algorithm with kids, which is a nightmare to say the least, or, and, and has been written about a lot. So that was the, the excited nod. <laughs> Well, yeah, nothing to be embarrassed. And also the fact that so many people feel it as an embarrassment, I yeah. think it is also an indication of the need for intimacy and the ways we try to self-soothe. And also, if you look in the comments of many of these videos, I mean, talk about mothering, there's so many questions and just blur, you know, just blurting out of like, I had a, I had a terrible mother, you are replaced, like really active transference and counter transference that are so obvious. Um, so that that's an interesting question. 
so uh, we're, we can sort of wrap up. I think one of the points I think that we didn't really talk about is uh, this is all also about the self and sort of instead of talking about community care and mutual aid and solidarity. And I think one of the, the questions that we are left with is also how do we care for ourselves, but how do we care for each other? And sometimes therapy and it's like, you know, the one-on-one -on -one and the intimacy that comes from that is not, is not that and it's not enough um, and sort of requires more structural changes. So I just wanted to have <laughs> leave with that uh, broader critique of our neoliberal times. Um, any final remarks, but thank you so much um, in the meantime to everyone. Any final remarks from you, Romy or Hannah? Um, just to say thank you to everybody that came and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, Hannah, I just think it was really, really important for me to understand a, a longer term history between technology um, and the delivery of therapy. So thank you. And just also going for something we haven't been able to spend much time talking about, but just this idea of kind of digital inclusion and also making sure as things move and as we, um, you know, provide therapy in different ways that we aren't excluding important populations who for many reasons cannot access what, what we're moving towards. So yeah, I guess that's just something I want to end on. But thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, and it was 40 minutes of a soap cutting video. I'll have you know that I watched 40 <laughs> minutes. Thank all your favorite ASMRs in the chat. And, uh, we can share, share the soothing around. Yes, everyone, everyone wants to be soothed. I just want to also say thank you so much to everyone joining and to Dead End Society, to Livia, to Romy, to CJ. Um, to Nazali, uh, I want I want to just maybe bring those two questions together: uh, the individual one to one, and uh, digital inclusion. You know, I think that this history is really powerful that for that as well. That before our appified moment, people use technology as infrastructural projects uh, to reach each other. So, and just the you know history of the suicide hotline is is a radical you know, queer history about reaching the anonymous voice and and being held by a peer over a telephone wire. And that we can be really creative about how we use these technologies safely in terms of privacy and non-exclusively to make new community. Um, and that that was represented as the, you know, only silver lining of the pandemic during the uprisings of 2020 and in mutual aid groups as well. And you know, that's the thing to look out for as well. And thank you so much again. For sure. So on that note, thank you, Hannah and Romy, uh, for sharing your expertise. Um, so thanks, everyone, for coming together in this very meta discussion on Zoom, fatigued and, <laughs> and all. So uh, please check the chat for hashtags to keep the conversation going. You can visit Data and Society's website for the event recording. We'll have that up soon and learn about our research, uh, job opportunities uh, and programs. So we have our next book forum on February 3rd when my colleague Serena Oduro hosts Catherine Knight Steele to discuss black digital, fe uh, digital black feminism. So thank you and take, um, take care. Bye.